Hello, beautiful human. I am Zach. That is Dan. Yo. And do you go by Dr. John or the full name? Dr. John Deloney? So here's the deal. Deloney. It's like Deloney? It rhymes with uh, Baloney? Baloney, except with a D, yeah. It was yeah. a long childhood. But like my, <laughs> my mom was a gangster, and she was Dr. Deloney before me, and then my wife got her PhD before she was Dr. Deloney. So like by the time I got around to it, it was like, yeah, whatever. And you're, so I'm John. <laughs> I'm just John, dude. And that's what, like, if, man, if I can just get my buddies to call me that instead of some of the stuff they do call me, I'm good. I'm good. You're around a lot of doctors. Yeah. Everybody doctor in a different field or what? No, uh, yeah, yeah. My mom's story was a little bit unique because she grew up in this really rigorous uh, faith tradition. She wasn't allowed to go to, like, women had no business being educated after high school. And so at 41, she finally got the courage. And my dad had been, like, like, we believe in you, we believe in you. And finally, she got the courage. At 41 or 42, she took her first community college class. And the next semester, she took another one. And the next semester, she took another one. And then she had one professor pull her aside that says, you're really special. No one had ever said that to her in an academic setting. And so she graduated with her PhD at 57 and got tenured as a professor at 63. And this summer, we just cheered her on. She just finished her last summer at Oxford in her 70s. Holy shit. She's a gangster, dude. So, yeah, she's rad. And so, That's so special. It is, but I had this, like, picture of, like, there's no such thing as you can't, and there's no such thing as you're too old, and there's no such thing as, but a path doesn't exist. Well, then you need to go get a machete out and carve one. So uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty rad growing up in that with that as in your DNA, right? You see that, and you see how beautiful it is to achieve that incredible feat mm -hmm. with so much stacked against her. But you wonder why it took her so long to begin with. Yeah. And do do you ever wonder about mist or a what if? I do, except I, I've come to believe that the what if is one of the most, um, one of the most wasteful questions I can spend my time focusing on because it, it locks me back into a, a, just a spiral of regret and should have been. And I imagine stories that may not be true about what could have been. Or how about a why? Yeah. Why, why is a, is a, is another picture that I think is, is good to keep in, cause I want to capture that why that she captured because I got a seven-year-old little girl. I want to make sure she gets it now, right? Ah. And so that's that's a beautiful that's a beautiful question, I think. And history repeats itself, right? Always. So if you don't ask yourself Always. why, you can fall into a trap that you could have already been in. Yeah. But I think more important than asking yourself why is making sure you live it out. Ah. Keep living it out, living it out. I think a lot of us spend a lot of times in our head and we come to these great conclusions and we just watch the next show that pops up on our screen and we ah. just go to the next thing automated. And so I think living it out in real time is that's the key. How do you stay present, right? And obviously we're talking about living a non-anxious life. Yeah. And I've never heard of the idea that like anxiety is an alarm system for your body. Yeah. I never really thought that, but I do understand that. Yeah. That man, I I think we, we, you and I the same we were just talking about uh, the radio industry, we could talk about the mental health industry, but ultimately I think mental health practitioners wanted to be a part of the medical establishment especially when it comes to reimbursement and getting paid oh yeah and so got to come up with a diagnostic you got to be able to talk to other researchers and so they create this manual so that researcher can talk to researcher so if you say depression you say depression you say depression we all kind of know what we're talking about and so that we can report that to the insurance companies and we can get paid and then the internet happens and that manual becomes something we can all just google and get and so it becomes the way we talk to each other oh you're sad you got de you're depressed yeah Oh, you're really anxious. You're spun up. You got anxiety, and so it became a label that we stamp. And then we got off to the races, man. And it, it, it caused a mess. I don't believe, large scale, that our bodies are all failing us all at the same time for the first time in human history. I think if you look at your body, like your body's pretty smart, and if it's sounding the alarms in your life, that's the hard work, man. Because that may mean your relationship is over. That may mean this job you want to be a president so bad. Maybe that's not for you or you want to live in this community and do this thing that may not be for you right now or this season or ever. And so I think there's some hard reality. I want to drive this car and live in this house. Your body will shut you down if you owe that much money because it knows that you're one missed conversation at work from getting fired and losing your home. And so your body would be failing you if it let you sleep. Right? So I think going back and saying, whoa, whoa what if our bodies are telling us the truth? What if they're right? What if the world is not, uh, what if our bodies aren't broken? What if the world's gone sideways and we've created a world our bodies can't live in? And what can I do about that? That's a way more interesting question than, than here, here's the scary light bulb reality for me. It was 
more people than ever before in human history are under the care of a mental health professional right now. Mm -hmm. More people than ever before in human history are medicated (sighs) for mental health something or other right now. And the number is still, I mean, the the trend line is still completely vertical. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I have to ask myself a question as a mental health guy. What if what we're doing is not working? Like, what do you do then? And that's, that was a totally different question. It's fascinating because you're right. Like, you break it all down. Yeah, we're seeing more prescriptions written for a host of different ailments than ever before. I think money is directly linked to that. Oh. For every human being you get addicted to your drug, cash goes into your pocket. Forever. No matter who's being hurt. It is profit over people. On top of that, I do think, and I get what you're saying, the idea that all of our bodies collectively at this moment in time are not failing, working against us, whatever. True. What's the likelihood of that? I think so much comes down to society because you're talking about like, all these wants that you have as a person, you want to drive that nicer car, you want to get that big, bigger, better job. The only reason we want those things is because society has told us that we need to have those things in order to be happy, in order to be seen as successful by our peers, in order to have a good standing in society, in order to attract uh, people in our lives. I mean, everything comes down to what is not the fiber of one's character and being, but what one achieves or acquires. Well, it's so I, I, I like to go one step deeper yeah. and because I think when we leave it at a character or a moral issue, stop, like stop comparing yourself to other people. Totally. When we do that, I think then it puts, it, it puts me against the guy in the mirror. The step beneath that is we're designed to live in tribes of 150 people mm. and to be able to just go like this and look around and go, okay, I'm, I'm basically okay. And you got about three people in the tribe you can mate and reproduce with. You got three people in the tribe that are going to go hunt food with. You got three people in the tribe that whatever the thing is, right? And now we've been given these tools where our tribe is, you said two million people is in the show on the radio, right? Yeah. That's, it's endless. And I can scroll and scroll and scroll. And so there's never a, my body, like my nervous system can never be settled in its community because it's always adding new people to the community. It's always adding new people. And so that's why I say we've dropped ourselves into a world that our bodies can't live in. I don't even know that it's much of a character moral issue. No, I, I agree with you. Maybe the character issue is turn the phone off, right? Yeah. Maybe that's the, that's the moral play other than just stop comparing yourself. Because it's you know, so hard. To, it that's is. the hardest thing to do. But, you, but you've, been in the, you've been in a $200,000 car. They're real nice. You've probably been on a private jet. They're awesome. And so there's part of me that's like, that's not just imaginary. That is really great. It's pretty cool. It won't make me happy. It won't solve all my relationship issues. It won't make my dad call me and be like, you know what? I'm finally proud of you. That call's not coming, right? It's a matter of what if I got beneath it and turn the phone off? And then I have to look at my neighbors and be like, I don't know any of you guys. And that's where I got to start. And, and that's a much more terrifying proposition, I think. Totally. And by the way, it takes other people to do the same, right? Absolutely, yeah. And social media has changed almost everything. And there is something to this idea that in recent years, the stigma attached to mental health has become less and less. Like the idea that like nobody, for so long, nobody talked about mental illness. I think like it was just something that hung around and you just impacted your family, but was never really discussed or like you knew somebody, but it was just this, Maybe taboo is the right way to describe it. I don't know. But it wasn't ever held at the same level as physical health in terms of discussion and or importance. And we have entered into an era where that has changed. So maybe it is, maybe it isn't that our bodies are collectively failing us, but maybe we now for the first time have the bravery to talk about it. But I think that bravery at the same time is being exploited because we've seen the commercialization of mental illness like we've never seen before, which by the way, what's worse than not receiving mental health care, receiving bad mental health care. Cause think, think of, well, oh, man, you just said a whole lot right there. That's really important. Um, but I think it's both. And so back when like 
I don't know how old you are. Back when I was a little kid, 30. there was always like a guy in like at the church or in the neighborhood who had a quote unquote nervous breakdown. Yeah. Right. That's all of us. And so there has been an escalation. Right. And we had that one uncle or that one cousin who now all of us are rattling. So there's some truth to that. Like now it's okay to talk about it and it's becoming more prevalent. And with that comes, it's become an identity. And we become very proud of our labels. And so working with college kids for 20 years, the number of times a student would come in and be 19 and say, hey, I'm like weeping. And I'd say, come sit down, come sit down. And they'd be sobbing. I've got depression so bad. And I'd say, tell me about it. Like, well, my dad just moved out of my mom's, like out of our childhood home, just left my mom. And I'd stop and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not depression. That's called sad. That's called heartbreak. And you're supposed to be sad. And we've pathologized basic human existence. And when you start pathologizing how you feel, or you you make the God of how you feel, then you start chasing, I don't want to feel uncomfortable. And when you start making feeling chasing that man, and then you got a whole host of chaos, right? And so I think we've got a on one hand, we've got finally we can talk about it. And then there's the other hand, look what I have, look what I have, look what I have. Yeah. And so it's a both and. It's a both and. People do. I mean, we do find pride in labels. We do. Right, we find right. pride in identity. We find pride in exactly who we are. And right. uh, I know a lot of people who are on the younger side of, you know, Gen Z, millennials, that like will lead, when you first meet them, they'll tell you, you know, I have BPD. Yeah, exactly. You know? it's, that's, their, that's their entry point into who I am. Yeah, Hi, getting my name to know is. me. Hi, my name is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the reality is we're much more than that. I think we just infinitely more than that. And if you go, if you track a young person's life back to the possible chaos in their home system and you track their chaos through their lack of sleep and what they ate and the bullying they went through and being kicked out of the, uh, out of whatever um, majority, you know, was the cool, then their body's response makes perfect sense, right? It makes complete sense. And you go, oh man. And that I would lead you to say, you're not broken. If I drive my car real hard and never change the oil, like um, I can't blame the engine, man, right? I've put it in a situation where it had to function the way it had to function. So I think it's backing up and saying, okay, there's a mess. What can I do about it? What, so the answer is like, okay, okay. <laughs> there's no answer on my end. But the question is, <laughs> what do you do about it, right? So, so let me ask you this. So as I'm saying this, does it, is it, is your BS meter going off or is it like, no, no, this is plausible. This makes sense. No, I, I, this, this all makes sense. I, I believe that, I believe that anxiety is a thing. I believe that mental illness is real. I believe that, uh, y- you may think you are one thing, but you may not actually be that. Mm-hmm. I do believe that. I think people just are in search for answers. We always want to know what and why, and give me, give me something, give me something to cure my curiosity. And, and, and that quest doesn't end until there's something. Right. And I think nothing or you are not insert ailment there. I don't necessarily think that's enough. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it, it He's, we, we in our, we've created a culture where being heartbroken or being sad, I don't care. You go to work. You, you got to be working at eight. Yeah. I got anxiety. Well, all right. And so there's something about reimagining compassion and empathy for people. And it's the old addiction conversation, right? You can yell at somebody like, why don't you quit drinking? Or you can pull up a seat and say, what happened in your life that the best way you can get through today is this, that your body has said, this is the way we got to get through today. That's a much richer question. And that leads you to connection instead of divisiveness, man. And um, I, I follow, I believe strongly with Dr. Gabor Mate, like, Addiction, any sort of these pathologies are, are almost always rooted in relationship, in disconnection, man. And I think you we've created the loneliest generation in human history. And I think you just see a cascade of pathologies out of that. A hundred percent. But by the way, like in believing that doesn't negate or uh, disavow addiction. Addiction is real. People are addicted to substances. Real. Yeah. And it doesn't negate personal responsibility. Yeah. Like, so now what, right? What are you, what are you going to do? Right. That's a real thing. And also I can sit with you and hold your hand and, and put your head on my chest and let you weep and say, I'm here with you. It's all at the same time. Right. Why? So 
uh, like, okay. I want to get into a bunch of stuff. Well, when you're talking you about this, I do have a lot of friends that wake up every morning and take their depression medication or their anxiety medication. It's making me think, like, do they actually need that? Mm. Is that actually helping them, or is there something else that they should be doing? Depression is a gnarly. It's like it's an octopus, man. There's there's tons of different layers to that one. I'll stay with so I'll stay with anxiety. Okay. Um, I I had. I took anxiety meds and I went and sat with a buddy who was a medical doctor and like I sat in his office. I'll never forget that moment for the rest of my life. It saved my life. And, um, like I busted into his office and pointed at him and said, I'm not okay. And he's like, bro, sit down. And we, we spent a couple hours together, but anxiety just turns the alarm down. It doesn't fix anxiety. It just turns the alarm down so that I can go sit with a counselor and be completely honest. So I can tell my, romantic partner, I'm not all right, so that I can sit with my kids and say, I'm so sorry. Can we get a control alt delete on our relationship? Can I start going to the gym? I can start sleeping at night. So the meds are a bridge. They're not the the destination, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's but it's hard though. It's a lot of work. It's really hard. It's like getting out of debt. It's like healing your romantic relationship. It's hard. Um and there's this like internet meme that I kind of rolled my eyes at when I first heard it, and now it's become, uh, it's gained more and more truth the more I've sat on it, which is the choose your heart. Y'all heard that? Um, that? You can be 100 pounds overweight, and that's hard. It's hard on your health. It's hard on your knees. It's hard on your back. It's hard when you're driving. And you can lose 100 pounds, and that's really hard too. You can fix your romantic relationship. Y'all can sit across the table and say, are we going to do this? Are we going to not do this? And here's what's got to change. And I'm sorry. And all that, or you can not, and you can just be roommates like millions and millions and millions of couples are. We can co-manage this house, but we're not really together. Mm -hmm. Both of those paths are hard. And I think we've tricked ourselves into believing one path is easier. One path is harder. So you can wake up every day and shut the switch off to hurt and to joy. You can flip that switch off to start the day and you can go through your life that way or you can keep that switch on and choose to sit down across from somebody and say, here's what hurts and here's what happened to me when I was a kid and here's these things. Both paths are hard and I think it's choosing which what's the hard path that's going to get me to where I want to be versus to this hard path. I just want to do this for the rest of my life. That is all like incredibly vital and valuable and the truth you can still be anxious after doing that. All that, yeah. And but I don't want to live in a house without a smoke detector. Uh, of course. And if if you shut the anxiety alarm off, like that's like climbing up in the in your kitchen and taking the batteries out. You turn the noise off, that's great, and your house will burn down around you. And so the goal isn't to not ever be anxious. The goal is to have those alarms not spinning off 24/7, 365 all the time. Totally. And I also think it's about properly defining things yeah. because you can have a conversation with someone that's positive and meaningful and make progress and still be anxious about that relationship moving forward or, or think that something happened in that, that, that conversation that didn't go as planned or they're acting a certain way. So the, like, there's a lot of ways to get into your own brain about something. I don't think that's anxiety though. I mean, that's like, when you get into rumination, which it was, what most people do all the time. They do. But rumination feels like you're, it's productive thinking. It's it feels not. like you're pre-planning. It feels like you're, you're rehearsing. Rumination is a complete and utter waste of your time. It solves no problems. Zero problems. Rehearsing, like I'm going to sit down and tell my partner that I had an affair. Like rehearsing that, that's important. You say that out loud and you get in front of a mirror and you practice that. That's cool. Or I need a, I need a separation for a while. But just that, that it, you, I, when I travel a country, I hear it most, like people do this in the shower. They have that imaginary conversation yeah. with their boss, and dude, they go to war. Like, I'm just gonna tell that dude, I'm I, when he comes. You're never gonna have those conversations, man. Not in real life. They're never gonna happen. But your body doesn't know the difference, so it spins up the fight or flight again, and it goes to war again. And you're just cooking and cooking and cooking, and then you just walk in the next room, and somebody's just watching TV. Right? I mean, they don't even know they're in a fight. They don't even know they're in. And so for me, it was a it was a big practice right. to stop ruminating because it's a waste of time. It's hard. It's real hard. Yeah, all I do is fucking ruminate. It's it's real hard. But what does it get you? <laughs> oh, I, I mean, sometimes I'll stick to the script, but most of the time I don't. I know, but what? But like, it gets uh, you nothing, something. No, I mean, it's Netflix, though, right? 
I don't know. Yeah, like you're watching. Like it's a numbing device. A part of me just feels like I'm accomplishing something when I'm really not accomplishing that's anything. That's it, right there. <laughs> and it's, it's it, ho- yeah, that's yeah, it. It's fucked. That's it. That's it. And ultimately, it does like a lot of times it's caused problems that like didn't actually exist. Like I'd get out of the shower, and my partner at the time would be there, and they'd be like, "What's wrong?" And like they really didn't do anything, but like I just fought with them in my head. Exactly. And you won. You crushed them. Because you always win those fights. <laughs> like, it was, you always mic drop every one of those yeah, fights. Yeah, it's me versus me. Ex- yes. Yes. And what if we all decided to stop going to war with ourselves? Well, you got to distract me with something then, dude. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Fuck. No, dude. That's so exhausting, though, isn't it? Yeah. But I need a distraction then. Because, like, then my brain... But, but that's bullshit, too. Because even when I have distractions, sometimes, like, you know, that shit will take over. It, the the greatest book title I think in human history is "The Body Keeps the Score" by Vanderbilt, mm-hmm. and whether you know it or not, it's keeping tally. And so every time you go to war, your body's got scars, whether you know they're there or not. And here's how this best played out, man. In this, like what I'm going to say sounds so cheesy, and it's a it was a it's a delicate moment that I've only started talking about recently. Um, so I've got a uh uh mental health show where we talk a lot about parenting and romantic relationships. We all that stuff. We cover everything. My, she's now seven. My little girl for the last like three or four years, she wouldn't hug me. She, she's not on the spectrum. She doesn't have any mental health challenges. She would just be like, no, nah, dad. And it was funny. And then it was kind of frustrating. And then it was silly. And then it was a game. But more and more started to gnaw at me and gnaw at me. And it was my wife that said, hey, you're always preaching about neuroception, that little scanning device that's in all of our brains, always scanning 24-7. Are we safe or not? Are we safe or not? Are we with our tribe or are we not? She said, what if that little girl has identified you as not safe? And I was like, I don't yell. I don't hit anybody. I don't swear in my own house. Like, She said, yeah, but you got that nuclear reactor right here in your chest. And that was the first time I went and sat with a trauma counselor. And I said, I'm going to say it. Here's what happened when I was a kid. This would happen. And I'd never said that to anybody. I've been married 21 years. I never told my wife. And we started, she's like, game on. And so we started like a healing journey that way. And just a few weeks ago, I said a sentence out loud that I had, like it caught me off guard as my daughter was treating me like a jungle gym. And I said, get off. (laughs) And I said it with a laugh, but I thought, oh man. And so it was, it's here. And that's that word that I don't think we have a cultural definition for anymore is peace. I don't think we know what that is. I don't think we know what that feels like. And I don't think we understand what it could be like to just go to bed at night when you're tired with nothing. Isn't it wild that your daughter was able to tell? Like your daughter knew something. Well, I mean, I think for like evolutionarily, that's she's crazy. a teeny, light, tiny little body. And she said, the man who loves me tells me every day of my life that I'm brilliant and I'm strong and I'm beautiful. He loves me, but he wants to fight. And she felt that. And it was me having to go do my work. I think children absorb the tension in their house, man. And that, like that has been something that's been on a loop in my mind. And I, I, my granddad, like world war two, he fought Nazis, (laughs) right? He knows peace is not that. Uh. I don't think we have that. I think we have peace as I don't have the next stimulant. I don't have the next or the next numbing thing that on or off switch. I don't think we have that. And man, if you can carve out peace with what you see in the mirror, if you can carve out peace in your home, I mean, that's, that's a game changer. But that's a definition that is unique to everybody. Like it is. That's, it is. It because is. peace for you is not peace for me or somebody else. And that's, it's not, but it, it's a lot more, it's a lot more a lot more universal than I think we like to admit it is. Totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's little things like getting a hug from your daughter. Yeah. That's totally. Or what if when uh you're those who grew up in an abusive home and that car driving up the driveway, you just with automate it. You don't even think about it. Your body just starts to finish up what you're doing and head to the room and shut the door. Because you knew as a kid, like we should probably get small and disappear. And then you take that into your romantic relationships. What if when you walked into your home and it just felt warm and you walked in your home and people were laughing when you walked in the door? When's the last time that's happened to any of our homes? And uh, or walk in the house. My wife and I, as we were trying to re-envision our marriage a few years ago and it was, it was things weren't great. Instead of talking about all of our, like, because we're both, 
we're both writers, we're both wordsmiths, we're both academic nerds. What do I want this place to feel like? And that threw me for a loop. Mm. So we went down, it was like, I want it to be like I walk in and people are laughing and you throw something at me. And my daughter races at me with a pillow and a stick and I'm in a sword fight I didn't even know I was in. And my middle school son is, you know, making middle school boy jokes. Like, I want warmth. And like, okay, we can go get that. But that's peace, man. And then we have a culture designed. If you're peaceful, you don't spend money as much either. You don't buy as much. You don't click as much. You don't scroll as much. And so there is a vested interest in keeping you spun up, keeping us all spun up. Oh, I agree with that. I, you are so correct. Like, dude, people make money from us scrolling and being in our heads and not present and inactive with those around us and the tribe that we call our own. Even every bit of focus is about being connected to the larger system. Yeah. You know, it's never just made for you and yours. And I think that hurts way more than it ever helps, but also like uh, that's, this whole thing is really wild because <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like getting out of the matrix, man. No, well, yeah, it's something I've just, I know that a lot of it is constructed by so much. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that like a lot of the problems that we face are, dude, they're like, they're very much like people have very simple wants and needs and they find peace in very simple, basic ways. Yeah. Right. And I think the large mission is to address the trauma that everybody holds within because that's actually the only way you create a healthier society and you actually then produce healthier people and the generations that come after us, you know, actually progress mm -hmm. in a better way. Um, but on top of that too, there is like definite wants and needs from people that should be met because peace does come from, you know, not having to figure out how to pay for your next, you know, meal and not having to struggle to keep the lights on and, not having to fear whether or not you have a school that is safe enough for your kid. That's like right. peace does come in different forms. And I think those that's universal, man. A hundred percent. That's universal. Yeah. And and I think society has chosen to turn our backs on investing in people's peace. Yeah. And if you invest in people's peace and in people in general, everything tends to rise. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a believer in like nobody should ever go hungry or nobody should live without a roof over their head. You know, universal basic incomes would actually change the world for the better because what you the way you'd change money from going into government programs like food stamps, you'd just be putting right into the people's pockets and people feel empowered. Except that so let me here's go my ahead, here's my me. like in my soul that feels right. Yeah. And you know uh Mike Rowe, the dirty jobs guy? Of course. So Right during COVID, he was in Nashville, and we are having a chat. And he, he was with, with Dave and the gang there. Dave Ramsey, said, icon. He said something that uh, I haven't felt like my soul get melted on something in a while. And he said, watch what's playing out. He said, when they told 35 million Americans your job's essential, they told 310 million, we don't right. need you, go home. And we'll just mail you checks. You lose purpose. But people went home and they got checks in the mailbox and we went crazy. Yeah. No, because true. we lost purpose. But and, and, and that's what scares me. Here's the deal. People want purpose and desire purpose. People want to know that on a high school mm -hmm. diploma, their kids are going to have the opportunity to learn trades yes. that can keep them and their family fed for generations. And do hard things. Oh, 100%. Solve problems, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But dude, AI is a huge risk. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but I just believe that like nobody should ever live under the poverty line if you're out there working. And if you're doing things like making my food or helping me at the grocery store or helping me check out at a clothing store, dude, those people have three kids at home. Yeah. Okay. And yes. you want to know how hard it is to stretch 1150? <laughs> it's impossible. It's, it doesn't exist. It's unstretchable. That's right. That's and right. then what you end up happening is the debt system that just builds on itself. Slavery. Yeah, that's right. That's it's, right. It's a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah. So, yes. Like, people stayed home, they did nothing, they got used to the checks, but also it was a demoralizing time yeah, for society. Yeah, I don't even think it's to get used to, it was demoralizing. That's, That's what it, it was. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. It really was we demoralizing. Don't need you. Like, and that ooh. is terrible. Yeah, But the yeah. people who work and give their all, Yeah, I deserve that. I, I think that you you and your kids and, and children and family deserve something. I don't know. It's like, it's hard because, uh... I think, I think it's, over it's, people. it's... I think the only question in that I think every 
if you don't if you don't understand that sentiment, I think that you're probably struggling with some sort of challenge with empathy. Totally. I think the only question, and I think it's a question that needs to be had civilly over a beer and some coffee and a, and some chips and queso over across the table is who like who pays for it, right? Yeah, of course. Is it going to be a, a centralized system or is it going to be if you know that guy's making eleven fifty, then you tip like crazy, right? It, well, it's 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 A or B. Let's have that conversation. Totally. Not the no, nah, they just deserve to be hungry. Like no nobody agrees with that. What do you think of a national health care system? Um, I think a couple of different things. I think our system right now is such a chaotic train wreck and it's produced some of the most mind boggling extraordinary advancements in, in medicine. And it is like uh, we took our kid to the doctor the other day. It was such an embarrassing zoo. It's so sad, right? It was heartbreaking for like a quick something or other. And it was like $2,800 plus of this, but and I've got great insurance like it, the whole thing is insane, and I haven't met somebody from a universal care system that says that's working great either. And there's long term bankruptcies, and so I think there's a way that you can have a standard of care. And then here's the deal: Dave Ramsey, like you mentioned, he's an icon. Yeah, he owns a bunch of real estate that he has spent his his career helping people out behind closed doors. Right? I don't talk a lot about him because I know he's private, but. He's a generous beyond, like, in other planetary senses, right? How he takes care of people behind closed doors. And um, and yet, he's amassed a significant fortune. Yeah. You can be generous. You can be both. Yes. And if he was able to buy a bionic leg and I wasn't, good on him, right? But I don't want to die from a leg infection. Does that make sense? And so it's both and. It's that, both and. And that's... I do believe that if we realize that people are our greatest asset yes, as a society and as a country, yes, everything else makes more sense. And the idea that there's a business attached to you coming back to the doctor for more care, as opposed to me as a provider of care being rewarded if you don't come back to me yeah. because you're taken care of and you're healed. It's a flawed system. Except you're seeing it to start to start to turn in really ro remarkable ways. People are ways. trying. My friend works for an incredible startup that is trying to convince people that like our success is based on like people coming and then coming infrequently. And it's a mental health care facility that treats addiction and a bunch of stuff. And it's more about coming come to us mm -hmm. and then let's get you back out there into society as opposed to come to us, keep coming to us. Yeah. Keep coming to us. Keep coming to us. Success should be rewarded based on how people are healed, not how people continue to hurt. Yeah, there was a there was a group um, out of Texas where I where I lived before I moved to Nashville, and they started a medical practice based on a subscription service. And so you paid a significant amount up front to get all the blood work and everything done. Sick. And then inside this facility, there was a gym, there was nutritionist, there was yeah. all the people. It's a holistic. Uh, and they said, I'll, we'll make our money off of you in year four and five and six and on when you're still paying for the subscription, but we will have done the hard work and you will be on the path to being whole and well. And you'll only need to come when you break your arm or when you have a catastrophic, you know, fill in the blank. And, but these every day, the, all the times um, will work themselves out of step. So I think That's, we'll figure some of those out. But where I see it, it changing radically is I think it was Australia a few months ago that came out and said, front line, we can't deny the research anymore, no matter how bad the pharmacy industry wants us to. Front line defense for dysthymia, low level depression and anxiety is exercise. Uh, Start there. And clinicians, you're now empowered to tell your clients, I want you to start a 30-day exercise. Just go walk. Just go for a walk. And we'll start there. And so that, I think, is how it's going to start to shift and turn. Great. Yeah. By the way, I, my friend came here and uh, had type 1 diabetes living dormant in them. They come to America for a few weeks. Uh, their type 1 diabetes presents itself. Hey <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like, oh, oh a few uh, burgers. Okay, cool. Salt. Yeah, different types of sugar. Though. I love burgers. Yeah, it just hits different over here. <laughs> um, so they end up getting diabetes, right? Type 1, very rare. It, it, Modi, mature onset diabetes of the young. Okay. Um, it, try, tried to get them into doctors here, impossible, impossible, impossible. And eventually it's like we just got to make the – we got to come together and be like, okay, we're going to send you back to Australia and figure it out just to get an understanding. 
This person lands at 5 a.m. on a Sunday, right? They go home in the shower. They're in the hospital by 9 a.m. They're in a bed by 9.15. By midday that day, they have their own specialist and they have enough pills to get, uh, pills, uh, pens and all the things mm -hmm. to get them through a year and a half of treatment, okay? By the next morning, they're back at their house. They leave to come back to L.A. that night and they have a specialist who's tracking all their data on their arm, sending emails, on the phone with them, mm -hmm. like, very Old much CGM. about, yeah, dude, dude, it's yeah. like, you're here. Like, how the fuck do we get you better and get out? Yeah. It, it's not, it, we're not milking this. Wow. Because if you're out there doing things, then you're making us money. Mm. That to me, like, when I see that and I go, dude, we got two and a half month wait times to get an endocrinologist at a hospital. Wow. We couldn't find a doctor to save our lives that wasn't a, a just like a, uh, what are they called? Um, the, for, for wealthier people, uh. Oh, like a concierge? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And even the concierge doctor's like, I can't get you in. Cool, yeah. It's crazy. It's a mess. Or it's could he get us into a special, like, I'm telling you, like, But here's, bad. I think the, like, in any any medical practitioner, somebody who runs a hospital could be listening to this conversation and be mm -hmm. like, they're missing this and they're missing this. Of Great. They, yeah. Here's the problem. That conversation by people who can actually invoke change is not allowed to happen. It takes place in podcasts and on over it's the so airs true. by guys like us who... Uh, men and women like us who are are not super educated on how the inner workings of the system works. I just know that when I take my seven year old for strep throat and my bill is two thousand dollars, and if I make one phone call, it goes to six hundred dollars, and if I make another phone call, like at some point something's not working. Flawed. And so, can you say both? And can we say we've had amazing advancements, incredible advancements, and we got a lot of work to do? Can we say both things? Can we do both things? And that's just about telling the truth, I think. And, and nobody, just tell the truth. Nobody's telling the truth. Um, by the way, also living an unanxious lifestyle is kind of anti what the, the the man wants you out there preaching, correct? I tell you what, man. Yeah. In a in a pretty dramatic way. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to shut you up. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, no one's coming for me yet. I hope not. <laughs> Fingers and toes. That's right. Fingers and toes. Fingers and toes. I'm a pretty lame guy, so if you want to come for me, I mean, I mean, like, I like to go to bed at like 9.30, so I'm not that cool. But you can come for me if you'd like. I'll, you can have some tea at my house. By the way, I've been reading through a lot of uh, the, the steps that you say one should take mm -hmm. in order to live a, 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 an anxious, free life, and it's daily steps. Yeah. And they are hard. Yeah. Is this, like, something that I – do I, I – my assumption is I'm weaving these – into through my actions, right? Like, and how I present myself in a daily basis, my my thought process. I, I can't really just check shit off yeah. as I exist. I can't be like no, chose freedom today. Well, well, I mean, but you can, you can yeah, Ex especially up, uh, up up front, right? Okay. So especially at the front end of, of this track. And some of the most um, the most dogmatic complaints I've got is, oh, so I'm supposed to do this every day for the rest of my life. And my response to that is, man, you can't. You can't brush your teeth so great on like a Tuesday morning that you don't have to do it again until Friday. Uh, like we've all true. like made peace with you got to brush your teeth a couple times a day. And if you have some gnarly food at lunch, you probably should do it three times. Like that's just kind of we we know that. Same with exercise, man. So, yes, once you get going, um it's a lot out of the gate. The more this becomes who you are, now after 10 years of this stuff, um it's 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 uh it's pretty regular. It's, it's regulating in my life. It's very few minutes in a day. Yeah. You say behavior is a language, which I definitely believe, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. You know, unless I said it to you, then it hasn't happened. But it's like, dude, I can read yeah. your energy, your movement, the way you're holding yourself, composing yourself. Like You can just get into the, and I'm, I'm going to get over my skis real fast, and so I won't dig into the science, but language is a whole different system. And it's, there's language, language helps us communicate, but oh. it's doing a whole bunch of other stuff. And, I just need to know I need what I see before you. Like, you can tell me, I'm so generous. I do this. I'm so much giving. Just show me what you tip, man. And here, I learned this. Um, so working in academics, I'm around some of the smartest people on the planet. And they studied their one little sliver of the world for 20 years, right? And I would ask, like, hey, what do you think? Here's a good example. I asked, I would ask all these folks, hey, what do you think about DEET and bug spray? I was out in West Texas and the, and the mosquitoes are the size of birds. and But also I was here and it was bad for your brain and all this stuff. And hey, what do you think about DEET? And, man, I would have a law professor tell me, here's all the stuff about it, and a, and a bioengineering professor, oh, here's all the stuff about it. But then we'd all be hanging out, and I'd see them spraying their kids with bug spray. 
And then it occurred to me, like, oh, what you think and what you do are two different things, especially when you're, um, when you're an academic, right? Your job is to punch holes in systems and to write about it and to think what could happen and let's prove it and let's study it. And so I remember leaving my wife's, um, like, we were doing a checkup after my daughter was born, and I stopped her uh, OBGYN. She was an extraordinary researcher. And I looked at her and said, hey, before we leave, what's the story on DEET? And she just rolled her eyes because I, I had been, I'd always be coming at her with questions. And she said, it's not good for you. And I spray my kids with bug spray because I'm more worried about bugs bugs and whatever. And I said, that's all I need to know. Like, oh, I said, do you spray your kids with bug spray? And she goes, I do. And D's not good for you, but these other things aren't either. And so I started asking people, not what do you think, but what do you do? And I get very different answers. Would you buy this right now versus what do you think is going on in the housing market? And I can ask that question. Well, I think, would you buy that? Yeah, I'd buy that right now. That's a different question, right? So behavior is a language. When your partner comes in and slams the door or your partner comes in and says, nothing's wrong, it is, it is. And if it's not, we should talk about it because it's making me uncomfortable. But we don't like to have that conversation, man. We like to just speak our words and then go do our things. It's true. Those are radically different things. It really, I mean, actions speak louder than words, right? But also to ourselves. Yeah. Totally, 100%. I mean, yeah. yeah. Also to ourselves, I often will have to stop myself and be like, I'm acting as though I'm like not doing great. Things are pretty good, man. You're like, yeah, things are good. And so I have to then go exercise, then go eat right, then go hang out with friends or whatever we got to do next. You keep mentioning chips and queso. I love chips and queso with all my heart, dude. <laughs> I'm from Texas. That's like, dude, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I get it. Like, it's, it's great. If I was ever, like, going to be fired, it would be awesome. My boss just got chips and queso. I'd leave with a smile. I'd be like, I, I see where you're coming from. It's time, time for me to go. Like, I'd be good. So when Dave Ramsey ever wants to fire you? He won't roll with that. He'll just still just fire you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, I love chips and queso. They're good. He really is an icon. Yeah, he's, he is, like, uh, like he's really a legend. Yeah. Really incredible. Dave Ramsey, we love you. He'd hate my finances. Oh, oh he is awful. Get into that. <laughs> It's bad. I feel like Dave Ramsey would yell at me and about my dis- my want for a universal basic income for those few- for people too. I don't think. It- well, I'd have to ask him about that. I don't think. I think. I think he would probably tell you that throughout history that hasn't worked. Yeah. Like we want it because oh. it sounds right. What I really want is if you clear out the debt system, then you don't have all these systems having to prop up how expensive everything is. I agree with that. To pay their own bills, and you get in this loop de loop system. I also versus- think you're right. You're right. Because, by the way, like, it's just, we're so riddled with debt that it's like, you're kind of fucked. We're not even playing with, with real math. And I think there is something to be said for, um, I remember having this conversation with my mom. It was a hard conversation. And whatever platform you put this interview out on, we'll all get a lot of mean comments from what I'm about to say. My mom went back to be a university professor, and, dude, she's incredible. But she's a medievalist. That's what she studied. She's a medievalist professor. Um, She taught freshmen how to write and sophomores and juniors and seniors literature, and she taught her grad students, whatever. Sick. And it was incredible. And I remember right when she first started, she was frustrated with what they pay literature professors versus what they paid law professors. And I remember saying, they have to hire law professors away from law firms where they make X. There's a market value versus a technical writer or an author or something that's going to come in here and write. So there's a market to this. And that was an uncomfortable, but she said, yeah, you're exactly right. And like, if you want to hire, you want to teach a bunch of people how to do brain surgery, you got to hire a brain surgeon to come in and do that. They're going to be expensive. And so I think there's also a peacemaking with, Hey man, what I'm so great at, I'm the best there is at laying brick. And the brick I lay will be here for a thousand years. If you go over to like Greece and Rome, those bricks are still there. And in the current world I was dropped into, brain surgeons make more. People who write codes for apps, they make more. And I'm at peace with that. Yeah, it's finding fulfillment and more than just monetary things from what you do. But I think we're all uncomfortable with this job makes more than this one and that's not fair. That's the part I think that we grapple with that is is a reality check. We have to totally. we have to choose reality on that one. To- 100%. I agree with that. And, and it's hard. That's hard. <laughs> yeah, it is. But yeah. that's only... Oh, Reality's hard. When we've reduced people to, hey, what are you worth? And we put a number on that question, 
That's the that's how we answer that with yeah. a number. Sure. Instead of what are you worth? Who loves me and who I love? What are you worth? Well, this much minus this much and my assets. And then we have turned people into little dollar signs as a culture. And then we start to balance, hey, y'all are worth the same. Yeah, you are. What I do for a living makes different money than what you do for a living. Yeah. That's the conversation we got to have. It's like this is because at the end of the day, it's like <laughs> I equate it to like a kitchen that's overflowing and under the sink, like the the pipes burst. Yeah. But there, you know, what do you do? Like, do you take a bucket and start shoveling water out of the kitchen or do you go right to the pipe and fix it before you shovel water out? Even before that, you go all the way to the alley and turn the water off. That's to the whole house. Yes. Probably for a couple of days. And then you go in and clean it up. and It sucks. And you didn't even make the mess. It wasn't even on you. It was four landlords ago that didn't fix that problem. But not by your hand, but in your lap. It's here. What are we going to do? We gonna yeah, do? how do you fix it? Yeah. No, it's really, the whole thing is like it's... um. But here's what's beautiful about it, I think. Yeah. I can get lost in the system conversations. And what I found is that was a great Xanax for me. By getting lost in the, this should be this way, and yeah, this, and because of this was a great way for me to distract myself from, well, okay, what well, can you do right now? Yeah, what, what's in your control? That's right. And so once I stop saying, okay, okay, I get one vote every four years. That's what I get. Huh? Cool. That's, 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 I get to throw one ping pong ball. <laughs> that's it. And, um, but I get to be nice to the woman who checks my groceries out every day. If I want to change society, I'm going to play that game. I can take my son to Waffle House. We go every Tuesday morning. And I can teach him, hey, did you hear that guy talking about, did you hear that conversation, how he just got to move out of his mom's basement and he gets to move into a hotel? We're going to tip him 150 bucks. Dad, that's crazy. I know. But because we've done all these other things, we get to do that and love them. And that guy chases me down the parking lot and picks me up and hugs me. And my son gets to see that and he goes, oh, that's why you don't owe anybody any money. Not so you can get stupid rich and whatever, which is a byproduct. You do that so you can love and serve your community. You do that every day. I don't need to wait for a government program for that. I can go be a part of that change right this second in my neighborhood. And that's it. You can wave the person sure. in traffic. That's how you change it, man. No, you're 100% correct. Like Actions like that go a very long way. Yeah. And also, it's a great example to set forth for your kids. That's uh, it. Yeah, that's how you keep the, those things moving. Is it bad that I don't want kids or a family because I don't want to have to worry about any of the stuff you guys are talking about? <laughs> I think here, here's the deal. I like, really don't. Can I, can I, like, in all honesty? Absolutely. It's the choose your heart. Yeah. Like, living your life. Can I, oh man, dude, talk, you're going to get, I'm going to get bad comments on this one. I'm saying this independent of these two awesome guys right in front of me. You can live your life. Like, I don't want to have to have all these hard conversations. I don't want the possibility that somebody, um, a loved one's going to get hurt, that they're going to get heartbroken, that someone's going to be mean to them, someone's going to bully them. I don't want any of that stuff. Cool. I would suggest that's a, like down the road, that's a hard path. That's hard. And put watching my heart put on a backpack and go to school every day, watching my seven year old daughter struggle in second grade, whew, that's hard too. Mm -hmm. And so I get to choose my heart. And I'm always, when I have to fit, like look, if I'm looking at which path, I'm going to take the one that's going to result in the most love, which means the most risk and the most vulnerability but the most light at the end of the day. And so, no, you're anybody who does the math on kids is not like, so, it never works out. You lose all your money. You and your yeah. romantic partner fight for forever. <laughs> Somebody just uh, takes your advice and like smears it all over the wall and goes and does what they're going to do. Right. And then you're yeah. there to hold their hand to pick it up. Um, but it's, it's, it's exponential. It's on the back end. Yeah. Cause I don't like doing anything in my life. That's going to add stress. Like I like to go to sleep at night. My only worry is making sure this show is running. Yeah. And I just, <laughs> Thank what? you. No, it's really nice. That's really the only thing I have to worry about. The show is running. I'm good. And I don't like to add things to my life that are going to add stress to it. And I waited till I got done with my first PhD. I waited. My wife did too. We waited till we, she had her tenure track job and I got my dean of students job to start having kids. And then the moment I had my son Hank, the first, I was like, ah, I should start this a long time ago. Because mm. a, a chamber opens up in your heart out the bottom that I didn't know existed. And it was strange. And dude, it's been hard. And we had lots of miscarriages, lots of loss, lots of, it was, it's been a mess. And I wouldn't trade it a second of it. So it's, so it's, it's both in. Yeah, you have to experience it to understand it. 
And, listen, if I don't and you don't one. get a, I saw Michelle Wolf the other day. She's an awesome <laughs> comedian. And she's like, you don't get a do-over on that one, right? So, I mean, you're kind of all in. It's not like buying yeah. a Tesla and being like, I don't like battery cars. You're stuck with this one, right? Um, but, yeah, you get a new chamber. I don't know. It's pretty profound. <laughs> but also, here's the other thing. I can talk all about kids. The data tells me pets are important, too. Well, I love animals. And like, I didn't want pets to be, but they're like, no, nah, if you have a pet, it's it's really good, too. Like I've, I've said here, like if I see a dog struggling, I feel terrible. Yeah. It makes me want to cry. Yeah. If I see a human struggling, I'm like, oh, that sucks for you. Yeah, you should probably go see somebody. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> no, I just feel so much empathy for animals. With people, I'm just like, it just doesn't click with me right now. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it's because I have animals. I don't have kids. Maybe. And people are overwhelming. And there's so many. There's, there's, there's. Yeah. So people don't want your help, right? Or they do, and if you don't want to give it to them, they get angry at you. It's like, yeah. that's not... Listen. Or if you don't give it to them in the right way. Like, it, people that are messy. Too. People are messy, yeah. and they're complex. And they expect so much from me. Like, I won't go to weddings. If I have to pay a lot of money for weddings, fuck that. Count me out. <laughs> and my friends get angry at me. Like, it's yeah. my fault I'm not coming to your wedding. Like, I'm not going to rack up credit card bills and put myself in debt to celebrate you for a day. And there's a 50% 50 chance you get divorced. <laughs> I'll go to the next one. I'll catch the next one. Yeah, I'll get the next one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, no, I just... Okay, I just... There's just a lot of things. I'm just not yeah. going to put myself in a situation that's going to backfire on me. I'll tell you that's a that's it. You're not asking my opinion, but I'll tell you anyway. You can just edit it out. That it's selfish. No, it's not that. It's um, it's self aware. It's it. Well, you, you have to say I'm asking you. I'm asking. Okay. I would like your response. My guess is somewhere along the way, either you saw somebody get hurt, or you experienced that, or you saw something that didn't work out, and your body put a GPS pin and said. Let's circle up because that's not safe. He's got some weird stuff. Like he's never I, gotten his mom a gift. I don't. I don't. I don't. Why? I don't. I just. It's your I, mom, dude. I I don't buy gifts. I don't. I don't want them. If I feel uncomfortable, if you get me a gift, I feel so uncomfortable. And so going back to what we were talking about very very early, I think it'd be fascinating to explore, in a curious way. Why does my body react when I get a gift? I can't even watch other people open gifts. If I'm at like a birthday dinner and somebody has gifts, I have to like walk away. You 100 percent should see somebody. It makes yeah, me yeah. so uncomfortable to watch that. He's seen you. Because you have to like you have to like watch them <laughs> fake being happy, or like I'm like I know you don't like that gift, and you have to watch them fake it, and then you have to look at the person who got but it. Why from are you in somebody else's head deciding whether they liked or didn't like something? That's an exhausting way to live. Listen, they're wearing uh, they're they're not hiding it. It's pretty <laughs> obvious. You can tell. <laughs> you can tell. Here's a language, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can definitely tell. Yeah. I don't know. Those things make me so uncomfortable. Yeah, I just never bought gifts because I'm like. That makes me uncomfortable, so I'm not putting myself in that, that situation. Makes your job as the head of this project pretty easy. You don't ever have to give him nothing. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> just high five him. Not even that. Make sure the check clears. I'm yeah. just really conf I, I get very confused. He also has no furniture, so he lives and he has no lights. So if when the sun goes down, he can't turn on any lights in this house. Candles? No, nah, I'm afraid of fire indoors. There you go. But He's no, with the apartment house. thing, I keep looking at nicer apartments because I can afford one. But mm -hmm. again. I, I why would I spend the money if I don't need to? Yeah, but it's more. You can also get a lamp. <laughs> yeah, but my electric bill is three to four dollars every month. And I see everybody else; they're like, "Mine's two hundred. I was like, "That sucks for you. That's that's you know six years for me." But it's weird. You're also complaining about going into debt for going to your friend's wedding. Yet you're saving all this money on your electricity bill. I just want to put my money towards things that I want to do, like, like travel, travel one day. Yeah, alone. I would. I love being alone. Yeah. 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 Yeah, like people, going on trips by yourself. Yeah, people think my way of living is so weird, but to me, it's just so normal. Yeah, there's definitely trauma there. He's asking what your thoughts. Well, are. yes and no. Maybe there is. I don't know, but I hear about all these people that are stressed, they can't sleep at night, and I fall asleep so fast. Yeah, and I wake up <laughs> very happy with the way I'm living. Yeah. So, what are your? I mean, can you ask him what his thoughts are on <laughs> what that? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, you sound like you're living a, a non-anxious life. I live a very non it. And I've actually gone through and like I try to check off these boxes. Yeah, yeah. Freedom? You live in, you doing that? I have all the freedom in the world. Nothing. Yep. Mindfulness? Yeah. No. That's the one you avoid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the one you avoid. Yeah. Anytime you want to be aware or curious, you shut that. You shut I'm that curious, one but then when it's, then when I have to answer the questions, I back out. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I want to know why, but then I don't want to have to answer. You don't like to choose reality. You like to avoid reality and you like to avoid... Uh, well, no. I think I like to choose reality because sometimes you just have to accept life for what it is. Yeah. A lot of people like to make excuses for things. I'm like, no, that's just that. kind of just how the life works sometimes. Except what happens when you wake up and you're 50 you know, and you don't have any community? Mm. And you've saved $4 on your electricity for the last 24 <laughs> years. There's a, mean, there's a remarkable book called Die With Zero. I don't like to look into the future, which might be a bad thing. That's, that's not choosing reality. 
Oh, yes. okay. And the loneliness by Cassiopo and his team, um, just one of the most extraordinary researchers ever on loneliness. That and y'all have heard that it's it's when your body recognizes that you're all alone, that you your tribe has got has left you. You woke up on the plains and they left you. And I'm talking ten thousand years ago. You're probably going to die. Wired into you is the need to be connected with other people. Full stop. In fact, your body can only recognize your position in space in proportion to other real people in space. That's why we all went bananas when the most, um, the, the greatest virtue we could have was to, to go home and stay away from other people. That was a great, and through all human history, the greatest gift you could be is to show up in people's pain in the last three years. Our greatest gift was to go away, right? Mm-hmm. And so when your body identifies that, it's more damaging than cigarettes. And they've attached it to strokes and Alzheimer's and cancer and a heart disease is your body spins up and spins up because it knows I'm the only one. And a lot of times when people find themselves lonely in a paradoxical way, they circle the wagons even tighter and they try to control every, every single variable more and more and more and more and more. And that's like, what about the future? That's a problem. That's a problem for future me. Cause right now I'm here, I'm safe right now. And it, boom. and so I always like to project out when somebody's 50. Oh shit. So you're like, telling me I'm going to die early. <laughs> I mean, kind of what I picked up on. You're kind of on a on a <laughs> on a bullet train. No. But 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 it's 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 that it's that mindful, it's that curiosity. Yeah, no, like, totally what about sense. me doesn't want to turn my lamp on? It makes sense, the math. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, but what's really going on? It's not about money. It's no, why don't you want about, light? Yeah. It's about grabbing onto every variable I can. Hmm. And in a, in a life that's spinning out of control, we start grabbing onto control in the weirdest ways. And often people who are isolated, when your brain recognizes you're on your own, it divides the world up into us's and them's instantly. And that's why we have a culture right now created of not people that we're all trying to solve problems together with. We are, our, our teams are people we all hate together. That's how we identify because there's no, there's no bigger issues to solve. It's let's bomb them. I think my life may have been spinning out of control when I started living the way I live. Mm-hmm. But now that it's not, I'm just used to it. You got it. Yeah. Huh. It's just it's just the way I live now. I'm just... And that's a strange thing. Like when somebody decides they're going to lose a bunch of weight or they're going to go to counseling for the first time, their system wants them to stay say, stay the same. Homeostasis is a powerful vacuum, man. It'll pull you back every time. And I think that's what it is. It's just being... I try to branch out, but I'm just like pulled back to what I'm used to. Hmm. Or comfortable. Very comfortable. Yeah. All right. Comfortable kills all dreams. That sounded like a good Instagram statement. I don't know if there's any truth to that. <laughs> there is a lot of truth. Sounds like a good like, tweet. That is a good, that is a good quote right there. Yeah. You feeling good? I I'm feel trying. Great. You you texted me earlier and you're like, hey, can you help him? So I'm trying. Thank you so much. By the way, Building a Non-Anxious Life is the book. There's going to be a link <laughs> in the description below. So if you're looking to do this, which you probably should be, uh, click it. Learn. Uh, there's a lot in here. A lot. And you're really incredible. Like You're very smart and... Uh, very cool, very articulate, but also like very uh, empathetic and kind and you have a deep understanding and you have a good heart. You're a cool guy. Well, I appreciate that. Man. Yeah. Uh, what are you thinking? Are you scared for your kids to get on social media? They're not on it. Well, when yeah. when they make the decision to get on it when they get older? Won't be in my house. <laughs> I mean, it's like uh, like I'm, I'm in some avenues. I'm not like my kids. We live out in, in Nashville um, on some acres outside of Nashville. And my kids run through the woods, man, and they go tromping and do their thing. And I take my kids to their friends' parties and stuff. Like, so in some areas, I'm hands off. But when it comes to that, um, when I just see the data on it, it's just absolute stone madness Mm -hmm. to hand your kid a smartphone. Yeah, it's nuts. It's madness. And then if you find yourself getting in either one of the political aisles to ban books or to what, but you're handing your kid a smartphone, I just, I can't wrap my head around that. It's insanity, right? I mean, you're giving your kid access to every predatorial company and person on planet Earth, man. Um, I just can't wrap my head around it. So do you think if, like, social media was eliminated, it would solve a lot of the issues with depression and anxiety that kids are feeling? No, because, I mean, the the data on that doesn't, I mean, doesn't back up social media as the Antichrist. Mm. I think it would force us to sit at a kitchen table and realize we don't like each other. It would force us to look in the mirror in the bathroom and realize we don't like ourselves. And I, th- I just think social media is, A, it's a great way to connect to other people. truly is. That's not true. 
It's a great way to communicate with other people. It's not a good way to connect with other people. You can communicate with everybody. That's awesome. Um, and it's a great, it's a digital Xanax, man. Yeah. It, I can lose 45 minutes of my day instantly. Instantly. Um, and it helps me just pass from point A to point B. Um, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good. But it's a tool. I mean, you hear that all the time. It's a tool. If I go around smashing all the sheetrock in my house with a hammer, that's stupid. But if I build a house, that hammer's pretty awesome. So mm-hmm. it's a tool. And um, I've had to learn the hard way because I was real outspoken. Was, you know, Jason over here is a social media guy that, that travels with us. He like, <laughs> man, I've, I, was, I was killing them early on. I was like, I don't want anything to do with this. I hate this. I hate this. And then real people would reach out and say like, hey, like I started talking to my wife differently or I took my kid to counseling and they're getting the help they need. Thank you. And I realized, oh, there's real people out there. Oh, yeah. Too. So, they are consuming it. It's just. Yeah, it's happening. There is some truth to the idea that like everything's okay in moderation, but the second one gets lost in one's self, self-worth and and to your point, like it's an it's Xanax. The second you start feeling that release that is given with every swipe, mm-hmm. it becomes a real issue. Yeah, it does, yeah. And I know I can't control it. And so I don't have a problem saying, man, I, I have my social media on a separate phone. It's not on my phone. and huh? So it's a tool. And I use Sorry. it for work, and it's a great way to communicate with people. But I don't need 500,000 people in my living room every night. I need my two kids and my wife and my two dogs and my chickens and I'm squared up. And maybe the neighbor's family that we invite over. That's what we. That's what I got space for in my house, right? I don't have 500,000 seats at my table right now. Building a non-anxious life. Check it out. Link in the description below. Final thoughts? No, yeah, it's all you. No, we've covered a lot here. I mean, like, I feel like everybody wanted me to hit you with all my problems, but Get I have a lot of deep-seated issues Bring that we can't. Yeah, we I can. Mean, I mean, dude, like, Four we're, minutes. Ta- we're talking about so much. We're talking about, we're talking about the decades of baggage that needs to Give be me impact. one. I mean... I don't know. I was going to therapy twice a week for a long time. Yeah. Um, and I was seeing two separate therapists for a minute. Yeah. Um, How'd I that seen, work out? It was okay. I was seeing an ADHD specialist and I was seeing a traditional therapist. Um, it was interesting. It was a lot of I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. It helped me get through a lot of issues that I was facing then. Now I just have a whole, whole host of new problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole, you know, you know, got out of one relationship into a new relationship, figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little unhealthy. I think you'd think I'm crazy. We met on Tinder, and we haven't been separated since we met. They may have moved in after we met for the first time. I wouldn't call you crazy. You sure? I don't call anybody crazy. Okay. Well, I think most people are doing what they can to get through the day. I would probably ask you, how's that? Is that, is that giving you peace? Yeah. And it's working, and I really enjoy it. Yeah. And we're getting to know each other real quick. <laughs> I bet so. It's giving a lot of steps. Sometimes those steps are good. Yeah, what steps do you think are the most valuable in building a foundation for a healthy relationship? Patience. Okay. Patience. And uh, truth telling. So. And not performance. And I think when you, the, the, the thing I would tell you like in a, like as a, not in a therapeutic context, but just as a buddy, um, when two people move in real fast, you often get in a very performative cycle. Totally. And you even perform that you're not performing. This is just me with no makeup. This is just me who I am. And that's a performance. And it's hard to find that, poof, this is just me. Am I enough? And that's hard to get to. When there's that patience built in over time, it comes out in, in small pieces over time. And then it's, you, your body learns, that guy's safe. Cause he sees me and he actually knows me and he still loves me. And that's, those are the three questions we're all asking all the time. Oh, in a therapeutic sense, how do I then retract <laughs> the, the, the situations I'm currently in or rehab it? Uh, dude. <laughs> we're off to the fucking races. Yeah. Here, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, this yeah. has been a month and a week. Yeah. A month and a week. I think probably uh, holding it real loosely. <laughs> Explain that. Um, what am I holding loosely? If you're off to the races after a month in the week, mo- a month in the week, the fact that you said we're off to the races tells me you started, y'all both started putting a ton of expectation on this relationship. Probably instantly. too Probably too much. That's a lot of bricks in that wheelbarrow to carry right out of the gate. Yeah. Maybe not. I should unload some of the bricks. Maybe. maybe. Or just, just uh, that's part of the adventure is to, it's like, hey, there's that one in there. Do we need that one? 
Because this is heavy. Because i got to carry your family system and my family system and your trauma and my trauma. Do we need that brick? Yeah. And, uh... Mining unloading bricks? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other conversation, but... But I, th- I think, um... One thing my wife and I have gone through is when she goes to a counselor and goes through a season of healing, it affects the entire equilibrium of our relationship. And like I said earlier, without even thinking, subconsciously, I want to bring it back to the way it was. And that's, I have to learn to live differently because I got a new person. The great Esther Perel says it the best that most adults will have four or five really deep loves in their adulthood adult lifetime, and if they work really, really hard, it can be with the same person. But we're always changing. And it's when you say the words, if we could just get back to the way things were. I just want to, I want to feel like I did when I was 20. I want to get back to, we're not, man. So my wife and I have this new exercise that's kind of fun. We're figuring it out as we go. We've never been parents of a second grader and an eighth grader before. We've never been married parents of an eighth. So we got to rebuild a new marriage because it's all new now. And then next year we got a high schooler and a third grader. We've never been married with a high school kid. We got to rebuild it now because I'm going to have all my high school trauma come out that mm. my body starts to set off hers and we're off to the races again. And so we're going to have to re get married again. And I, I've, I used to hate that and now I love it, man. And so it's figuring out, do we need to carry that thing? You carried that when you were ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, or that team kicked you out. I'm not going to, and learning to live with that kind of peace. That's tough, man. But that to me is the part of being in a relationship. You though, <laughs> You just keep those lamps out, man. You're squared up. Keep, keep that energy up. bill low. Do what? I said, I'll keep that energy bill low. Keep that that energy bill low and that risk low. Listen, I understand the problem. Social, social calendar low. The whole good. fucking thing. You're crazy, man. But also, here's, here's another thing. I'll give you this before. I... But there's a lot of stressed out people in this world, and I'm not one of them. I'll say this. I don't. Th- I don't think for a second something's wrong with you. Yeah. I think you may be in a season of of peace. Yeah. And recalibration. That's awesome. I think it just goes to like, it's the same thing as, I like wear the same thing every day. It's just, I don't want to think about it. That's right. Outsource, man. Wake up and go. You might be in a season of, man, I got hurt last time and I'm going to be wheels off on this one. Oh, totally. Wow. Spot on. Yeah. Yeah. I got very hurt. I was taking advantage of one of the, I fell in love with somebody who told me that they were in love with everything about me except for me physically. Um, But then we ended up. Let me 16. I was 16 dating somebody. That I was just head over heels with. And I'll never forget this because she said, and I quote, holding my hand, like my arm. Dude, you know when you hold hands, it's one thing. When then they hold your arm, it's another thing, right? And she said, you would be so amazing if, like, you'd be so gorgeous if your teeth weren't so yellow. And I was like, ah, and they were, they were yellow. It was about a year and a half ago. I was taking pictures with Dave at this big event and I noticed that we were clicking back through them. I still, to this day, smile with my mouth closed like this. To this day, those kind of things plant seeds. Your body puts a little GPS pin in that. I don't look good enough and that's a reason I'm not going to be lovable. And that's not the first person who's told you that either, is it? Oh, yeah. But this was the one that like, I let them say it and I was still in love with them and then I ended up letting them move in with me. We then proceed to like sleep in the same bed together and yeah. build a whole relationship for like... Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, but it was time. built on. Oh, it was built on them. I'll telling show me, you that I'm worthy in all these other places. Yes, with and I'll this, make it. And, and with, also this deep, like I want to prove you right. Like, y'all, right. I'm gonna make that's you right. be attracted to me. But there's a cancer in here. Oh my god, yeah, yeah. Really so hard. for what it's worth, you're worth more than that. Well, thanks. Yeah, you shouldn't have to buy someone's love. I didn't say that. I did. <laughs> Building an arm, anxious. <laughs> you should life. buy that book, though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah buy the book. <laughs> like, there's a there's a link in the description below waiting for you. You're incredible. Thank you for being here. Thank hey, you for giving us your time listen, and energy. Uh, the the most precious resource on planet Earth is people's time, and I'm I'm really honored that y'all gave up your time. I'm so grateful, man. Mutual, Thank Thank mutual, you. mutual. You're really an incredible broadcaster and a great source and a great like light and just force. So yeah. Thank you, man. Keep going. And Dave Ramsey, we love you. You don't know us, but I'm obsessed <laughs> with you. Uh, Dr. John, thanks hey, for we'll being here. Hey, we'll get you all the, if y'all want in, I'll send you all of the financial peace stuff for oh. free. All of it. Okay. 100%. Send it right here. Well, I yeah, he, he's I already in peace. I don't think I need it. You're debt free? You don't owe anybody anything? I don't owe a single dollar to anybody. That a baby. <laughs> Me, on the other hand, <laughs> I'm carrying enough debt for us times six. Yes. All right, I got you squared up. We'll thank, get you squared up. Thank you so much. My I got business you. manager I got is you. crying right now. <laughs> uh, I got you. Dr. John, everybody, thank you for Thank being you. Here.
Yep.